I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. Jimmy Changa, on his excellent substack, Smurfing the New Normal, has been providing a multifaceted view of the issues with Israel and Palestine, and I'll be responding to three of those. It started with Whose Land Is It Anyways?, in which he links Bibi Netanyahu making his case in an interview with Jordan Peterson. Another included a recent Yuval Noah Harari, someone I thought I was done with, but then things have changed. And he's talking about Hamas and Gaza and derides Netanyahu and calls for a global order. And then the third is a previous Jordan Peterson interview in which Majid Narwaz responds to the Netanyahu interview. So these videos are excellent ones to watch and I have all of them linked in the Substack. But first, I wanted to mention some links, partly so that I can close some of the hundred plus open tabs that I have right now. And these are all ones that I've read or I've listened to, but some of them I may follow up in another episode. I forgot that Julia Schoolifish was the one who had reviewed Son of Hamas by Mossab Hassan Youssef and raised some red flags. So these were things that also occurred to me when I was watching the videos linked there. Asa Winstanley of Palestine is Still the Issue is presenting some great sources. One is from the Electronic Intifada reporting that UK labor says Israel is right to starve Gaza children. And another is the world stands with Palestine again and shows current protest, but also shows ones back to 2021 and ones now in countries that forbid them. Minar Adley of Mint Press News has put out a video on Gaza concentration camp, which might be the best primer that I've seen on Gaza. Shahid Bolson, which is Middle Nation, has another very interesting video on message to the Israeli people, and that's one I may respond to another time. Teresa's Impromptu Scribblings has a link to the 1948 film Creation and Catastrophe on the establishment of Israel as seen through the eyes of people who lived it. Matthew Lemire has stayed focused on Israel's vaccine policies, which is an important clue, I think, to their subservience to the World Economic Forum. Jimmy Changa also quotes Martin Armstrong and links a short video of Putin's view of the conflict and his offer to mediate. Charles Wright shows up Ron DeSantis as welcoming Israelis to Florida with a free charter flight and saying that as president, he would allow no one from Gaza. A five-minute video is really good on Mossad's responsibility for 9-11. A very interesting article by Henry McCow on Were the Nazis the Greatest Hoax in History? And Unt's review is coming through as usual. Ron Paul writes about Hamas's victory and talks about the real reason it's Israel's 9-11, although he blames both Osama bin Laden and Hamas. James Corbett gives the real comparison, but unfortunately the audio is really difficult to listen to in that one. Pepe Escobar has an astute article on slouching towards the final solution that talks also about Pipelinistan, that angle that 60% of the gas reserves discovered in 2010 legally belong to Palestine, and I really recommend that article. And a central reading from France's leader is I Don't Argue with Israel Propaganda. It adds photos and formatting to a compilation of selected quotations from prominent Israeli and Zionist figures that embody the discourse of hatred, racism, and rejection. And hot off the press, Greg Reese just posted a very elucidating short explanation of Zionism and the creation of Israel that's unlike anything I've read before at least before 
I knew Nefahotep, Francis Leder, Fritz Freud, and others who have introduced me to the Sabbateans, Frankist, and Khazarians. So I recommend all of those. Starting with Jordan Peterson's interview of Netanyahu, this is called The Biggest Lie in the Israel-Palestine Debate. And by that, I believe he means that the land actually belongs to the Palestinians. So Netanyahu goes back to biblical times and he uses the authority in the Bible as if that's history, as if that is an actual land deed. He says, oh, and then there's Jesus. You've heard about him, right? Well, he was a Jew and that was 2000 years ago. And so that shows that this land has belonged to the Jewish people since time immemorial. And that then in the seventh century, the Arabs came and kicked out the Jewish farmers. And then it became a barren, desolate land. And he quotes Mark Twain in saying, I came and there was nothing there. There was nothing growing. Now, for those who have been following my other episodes, they know that the transfer agreement in which Hitler was able to move over a hundred million dollars worth of farm equipment to Palestine in order to help the Jewish people expropriate their wealth from Germany and reconstitute the desert. They know that that was actually stolen. That was stolen wealth that they used to turn that desert into an oasis, if that is how you see it. So I don't know whether that's something that they should be bragging about. And then there's Yuval, who is operating from such a sense of superiority that it makes me sick. He talks about how Hamas terrorists, they don't care about suffering. They only care about paradise. He does that whole trope of this are the ignorant, superstitious people, and we, of course, are not. And then he talks about how there was a Saudi initiative for peace, and maybe that was what triggered this, because, of course, they don't want peace, and how they have done crimes against humanity and the decapitation of babies. So right there, I knew with him and Netanyahu using that, that he is a part of this plot, that he is fully complicit in what happened and is perpetuating these lies. He talks about Hamas using people as human shields and that that is why they need to move to the South, which I think is a million and a half people who are living in the North and who they're pushing to the South so that they can completely raise that area. And the host says that the only outcome he can see is the Israeli occupation of Gaza. And Yuval says others in the international community need to come in and disarm Hamas and rebuild Gaza. And the host says, well, what about the UN? Yuval says it's going to be very expensive. But if you really care about the suffering of people in the area, this is what you must do. He also says that Zelensky is the most inspiring Jewish leader in the world. He looks at the problem in the world as being too many populist leaders. And in that, he puts Trump and Netanyahu. And that they are against the very idea of a global order. But if you don't have that, what do you get? Chaos, disorder. It's hard work, but someone has to do it. And he and Klaus Schwab are up to the task. So the only offer on the table, he says, is the liberal global order. And then there's Majid Nawaz and his interview with Jordan Peterson which was primarily about words and language. And 
he pushes back against Netanyahu for using an exclusionary language, a language that not just diminishes the Palestinian, but completely erases and others. He talks about Judeo-Christian civilization being a phrase that leaves out the Palestinian and all the rest of the world, and that when you only have your dignity left because everything else has been stripped from you, that that dignity is important. The only true peace is a peace of equals, and that's what the semantics do, that the semantics make it a peace through superiority. I noticed that myself quite a bit, not just with Netanyahu and Yuval, but definitely with every one of the quotes that are in Frances Leder's list in her compilation. They are so superior. There's not even a recognition of Palestinians as being human. They are animals. So I think that what Majid is saying is very important, especially for us, where you don't have any power in this situation. The only power that you have is the power of the words you choose to use. He says that words are spells, and in that, he and Yuval agree. So when I look at words like terrorist, what I've pushed back to many of the people online is to define the word terrorist without using a proper noun. And no one has been able to come back and do that in a way that applies equally to Hamas, but not Israel. That's not just semantics. It's not just sophistry, as they've accused me of. That's just looking at people as equal. Jordan talks about major actors who want this conflict to rage unabated. And Majid mentions Klaus Schwab and all of the major shocks that have been happening that are setting things into emotion. And so with the Great Reset, Jordan talks about a study that he did with a graduate student when he was a professor, and it looked at idea networks, ideologies that hang together, and what those were. What they found was that a liberal, compassionate inclusiveness also correlated with a politically correct authoritarian obedience, something that was willing to endorse things like force and coercion in order to get that across. And what he found is that the factors that indicated that were being female, having low verbal intelligence, and looking at dichotomies like oppression versus power, and then a feminine temperament, and also having taken a politically correct course. I think he's doing exactly the same thing. I think that Jordan is just another part of that authoritarian anti-wokeness that is keeping that pendulum swinging one way and the other. I've been seeing things like Justin Trudeau warning Western nations about the danger of wokeness. So first we were set up, and I believe this happened with Trump, with Trump being intentionally, intentionally offensive so that the whole liberal class went anti-everything with Trump and that turned them into being obedient and being pro-censorship and all of the things they had been against before. And now it's being pushed the other way. And I find that Jordan Peterson has a very bullying style of getting people to agree with him. I'm glad that I listened to this because now I recognize a lot of the things that I hear from other people. And now I know where they're coming from, 
which means that Jordan Peterson is doing the same thing. He's putting these things out there as word spells and getting people to buy into this reactionary mode once again that just pivots us in the opposite direction. I'd love to see the data and see how they determine these things like low verbal intelligence and feminine temperament. I think that he has no objection to people agreeing with an authority. He just wants that authority to be him. Majid then talks about how Quranic Arabic is the oldest continuous language in the world because even Aramaic, the oral tradition of the Bible, had to be revived. I also learned from Max Blumenthal when I was listening to him that Malula, Syria, is the place where Aramaic has been spoken for the longest time and that it was under attack and Hezbollah had to rescue it. That's the oldest tradition of the Christian Bible, but it took Hezbollah to rescue it. Majid also talks about how he thinks that the oral traditions are something that enabled there to be the relationship between a word and its context, and that once we took words out of the oral and made them written, that we made them into idols, that we made them into objects that were fixed and had no fluidity and did not respond to their context in the same way, and that the analytical mind can't comprehend the same spirituality in the way that the intuitive mind can when it's accessed through the oral tradition. This is something that has quite a synchronicity with Guy Duperol in his recent article, The Good of Evil and the Evil of Good. So I recommend looking at that in correspondence with this because I think Majid is on to something that words are so important and that there is a lack of the spiritual that is affecting us. And I would say that's also a lack of the feminine and the intuitive and the relationships between things that we are in an analytical world of objects and that those objects are something that I think feeds into this superiority. And I think superiority is the masculine. I was talking with a friend tonight that I think the toxic form of femininity is specialness, is that desire to be special. And both of those are ones that take us out of the world and out of where we need to be in relationship to others. In summary, I think that as Guy says, words are either tools or weapons. We can use them as spells that make our relationships stronger and that recognize other people with equal dignity and something to add to our knowledge. Or we can wield them as weapons that are stigmatizing, exclusionary, that see them as other. And that is something each one of us is responsible for. That's something that adds either to the harms that are being done or that brings about this world that is pushing back against that centralized power and dominance. And for two on why I think Jordan Peterson is on the side of patriarchal authoritarian power, here is Waking the Dragon Mom, and this is The Divine Feminine. Thank you for watching.